Thank you very much, uh, Ms. So. We appreciate your testimony, and we thank your family for their uh, collective sacrifice so that uh, you can uh, lead this important agency. Um, as we discussed in our meeting, um, the federal government has a special political and trust relationship with Native Hawaiians, and that includes providing health care through HHS. If confirmed, will you commit to educating other HHS agencies on that responsibility? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Yes, I, of course, I will be uh, responsible for that, and I will commit to working with you and the Native Hawaiians to improve ser health care services. Thank you. And one of the things that we found is that it's not enough to make a statute, and it's not enough to have the um, agreement of the political appointees of the, of the Senate confirmed folks, because where the rubber hits the road is in the notice of funding awards. It's at the line level where people are trying to configure RFPs and all of that. And so what gives me a little more hope um, is that you worked your way up through this agency. And so you know it's not just a matter of declaring um, that Native Hawaiians trust and treaty that our obligation to Native Hawaiians um, is both a political and a trust responsibility, but that people have to do it every day in the way they push money out, in the way they do consultation with Native communities. And I'm hoping that I have your commitment not just to sort of in front of the committee say all the right things, but to watch your folks to make sure that they're implementing that policy. And is that what I hear from you? Yes, Senator. Certainly throughout my career, one of the strengths that I bring to the organization is my ability to cross and, and work across lines, barriers, and so forth to bring about improved health care to all Native Americans and Alaska Natives, and in this case, our Native Hawaiians. Thank you very much. Um, your, your questionnaire um, is in order. I'm not complaining about it, but the, there was not any explicit reference to um, tribal sovereignty and self-determination. I'm not going to read much into that, but for the record, what are your views on the government-to-government -government relationship between the United States and Indian tribes? Thank you, Senator. Without a doubt, there is a trust responsibility to the Native Americans and Alaska Natives, with, with specifically to health care that have been documented through statute as well as the Supreme Court decisions. And if confirmed, how are you going to ensure that IHS both respects and uplifts tribal sovereignty, particularly through robust consultation? Thank you, Senator. Certainly the Indian Health Service, as well as HHS, has a robust tribal consultation process that we utilize. However, it's a little bit more than that. It's not just having a meeting and, and having a conversation with tribal leaders. It's really understanding the needs of each tribal community to help them best serve the, the people in their communities. Um, let me ask the question this way. Let's say you get confirmed, mm -hmm. knock on wood, nothing's ever guaranteed, especially in the Senate, but let's say you get confirmed and then you wake up the next morning and you have your meeting with your senior staff, some of whom you know, some of whom have been assigned to you and all the rest of it. What's the one thing you want to accomplish? And I mean in terms of the operations of the agency, because you've had now uh, uh, many, many years of experience within the agency leading uh, a big part of it. What kind of operational improvements do you see as the kind of low-hanging fruit? Is it electronic med medical records? Is it telehealth? Um, where do you see the, the biggest opportunity in the short run? Because you know that you know, uh, uh, a term of, of three or four years can go by really quick, and, and, and I want you to prioritize, and we want to help you to prioritize. Where do you think we can make meaningful improvements quick? Thank you, Senator. So certainly... I have already communicated this to the staff in the Navajo area IHS, and it would be the same for all of Indian Health Service, that we must, we must ensure safe and quality care to every eligible patient that we see throughout Indian Health Service and ensure that there are accountabilities throughout our processes to, to hold every employee accountable, including myself. So that we don't have, so, so we are able to provide the best care to the people we serve. Tell me about telehealth. Tell me about how much uh, potential you see there. I have 30 seconds. 
Thank you, Senator. That's pretty exciting for me as we shared when we talked. You know, in 2019, we had about 126 visits for, for telehealth. In 2020, we had over uh, 13,000 visits. So I know that in spite of some of the challenges that we have in Indian country for infrastructure, that we can do this and we can do it very well. I'd like to continue this uh, outside and beyond COVID-19. And on a bipartisan, I'll just make this final point about telehealth. On a bipartisan basis, this committee, other committees have been deeply committed to telehealth and also talking about the broadband that enables high, sort of higher um, end telehealth. But we should make no mistake, a bunch of telehealth does not actually require the deployment of uh, high, spree, high speed internet connectivity. And so we can't use that as an excuse not to move forward with um, uh, uh, with telehealth. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to have to wait on until we have high-speed high broadband connectivity, but there's also a lot of stuff that we can change immediately. Store and forward technology, um, uh, remote patient monitoring, none of that requires that we lay down cable. And um, so I want us to do both. We absolutely have to lay down broadband, but in the meantime, there's a lot of uh, uh, really exciting things that we can do to provide better service. Senator Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, earlier uh, this month, the Wall Street published an article, Wall Street Journal published an article uh, in regard to how bureaucratic red tapes hindered the ability of vital medical equipment to be deployed to IHS facilities, uh, particularly in the Great Plains region. Uh, the article talks about lengthy delays uh, in the deployment of the new medical equipment. Uh, in some instances, facilities have waited uh, for over a year uh, for uh, uh, the equipment. And obviously these delays uh, cause hospitals to search for alternative, sometimes even more costly ways to proceed while waiting for the equipment. So if confirmed, will you commit to examine IHS's procurement process and address these delays so that the uh, resources, particularly medical equipment, gets to these facilities in a timely manner? Thank you, Senator. Uh, the priority that I referenced earlier with respect to looking at the IHS business component of the organization that better supports the healthcare, it is directly related to our HR business processes, our contracting business process, and everything in terms of, of making sure that our policies are up to date. Uh, this can be done. We have systems in place that allow us to do that and in making sure that our systems are being utilized appropriately and properly is critical to our operation to ensure that we have proper medical equipment and supplies at all times in each of our health care and hospital facilities. Okay, thank you. Um, in 2017, IH was first listed on the government, uh, the government Accountabilities Office's GAO's high-risk list. 2017. That includes programs and operations that are vulnerable to waste, fraud, abuse, or mismanagement, and obviously need to be addressed. Um, IHS has taken some steps to address GAO's recommendation, but there's still um, deficiencies that need to be addressed. Um, so how do you make sure that those things get addressed? Thank you, Senator, for that question. So in the Navajo area, I arrived there in about August of 2019. And one of the first things that I did was to align the governance process for the entire Navajo area, as opposed to having uh, five, 12 facilities having different governance. We, we moved to a more uniform governance system. That's required, that is necessary for me to be able to determine where we are within the organization and instead of trying to manage many different activities, we're all required to follow the same regulations and so forth. That is the one thing that I think that I just needs to move to is a more uniform healthcare system. What this did for us in the Navajo area during the pandemic was it then allowed us to move a provide provider from one facility to another facility because we were operating under one governance. That means that we didn't have to have any delays for uh, credentialing and all of these other background checks and so forth that sometimes comes into play. So streamlining the, the Indian Health Service to operate as a healthcare system as opposed to individual operations is critical. And I know that it can be done and this has truly helped the way we operate in the Navajo area to strengthen our system. 
how are you going to recruit the skilled people you need in healthcare? I, I mean, everybody's looking for people in you know in almost every type of profession that you, there is. But in healthcare, it, it's just a, an acute challenge. How do you recruit the quality healthcare professionals you need? Thank you, Senator. Uh, at the Gallup Indian Medical Center, as an example, when I first got to Navajo in 2019, we were dependent on uh, contract providers in our emergency department. About 70, 80, almost 90% was contract providers. Today, we're almost 100% IHS filled positions for providers. And that's not using the, the typical strategy. Well, it is using the typical strategies, but what we did was partner with our providers that, that have colleagues out there. They are the best recruiters for us. And if we can build a system, a culture of care, a culture of safety within our organization, that's what's going to bring people to us. As of two weeks ago, when I was visiting with the staff at Gallup, we have providers that want to come to that facility. So again, streamlining the governance part of our organization that allows us to move around pro uh, providers to meet the needs of our of our entire healthcare system in Navajo. If we can do that, we need to do that. At, we can do that at the national level. And I have no, I, I believe that we we can do this if we continue to strive to build a healthcare system versus individual healthcare facilities. One thing that'll help you there is the, if you can reform and improve the credentialing, credential, credentialing process, particularly, for example, dentists. I've talked to dentists who want to come do pro bono work on a reservation, but they can't get credentialed. So I really think that's an area where you can have a big impact. Thank you, Senator. And we have streamlined that process in Navajo, and we do have a system in place now, including investing in additional staff resources to monitor the, the credentialing process and to make them move as quickly as possible into the process. Good. That, then that experience will help you, I think, in doing it for IHS. So that's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this so good to see you. Great having a conversation yesterday, obviously wanted to talk about uh, contract support and self-governance. So different styles of managing our Indian health and healthcare. And wanted to make sure that uh, we talked about how important self-governance is and contract support and making sure that the actual commitments are made in payments. Um, what, you know, we've had a couple of gaps here, and obviously you can have uh, IHS healthcare not be paid in a timely fashion, and then that impacts our tribes and their delivery system. What can you do to commit to making sure that we remedy these issues? Thank you, Senator. Uh, with respect to self-governance, I was fortunate when I came into the Indian Health Service to really experience those milestones that were put in place by many of the tribes, especially in the Northwest, where I was able to see many tribes move over and become self-governance tribes. Uh, with that said, uh, certainly we know how important contract support cost is for them, for any contractor to ensure compliance of the terms of the contract. And that, yes, that is one area, again, looking at the business component of the Indian Health Service, we can strengthen that part to, to ensure that proper payments are made in a timely manner. With regards to actual payments of funding, when, when we do get funding at the area level, within the Navajo area, our goal and my expectations was to ensure that payments were made within 24 hours to every tribe, particularly when the CARES money and infrastructure monies were coming down. That was critical. We're able to do it and we should be able to do that throughout Indian Health Service. On all contract support, you're saying? On all contracts. Well, I'm sure that'll be music to people's ears if that actually transpires. That's very important because what happens is you can't deliver care if you don't have the resources to do it. And certainly some of our uh, tribes are in very remote parts of the state, so it's not like there are accessible, easy options. And uh, so having discontinued care or, you know, things that can't be done in a timely fashion really do matter. Um, I wanted to ask you about 100% FMAP funding for our urban Indian health. Uh, Senator Murkowski and I serve a lot of constituents that are uh, Alaska Natives and American uh, Native Americans in the Seattle area. 
and uh, also in Spokane. So the issue is that the impacted urban Indian healthcare organizations are not treated the same, so they don't get to sh you know get the whole 100% FMAP funding. We were able to fix this, I think, for one or two years, um, but to me, it's a big inequity in the delivery of care. So can you commit to securing 100% FMAP funding on a permanent basis for our tribes, for Indian health clinics, sorry, in Thank urban areas? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I agree that, that we need to have equity in terms of funding for all uh, the programs that serve American Indians and Alaska Natives. We also know, I also know that there are some limitations Indian Health Service nor the department makes the determination on 100% FMAP payments. However, we can work with states, we can work with our partners to make sure that there's education and information flowing of how important this need is. So I will work with you on this if I am confirmed. Thank you. Do we have uh, Senator Langford online? If not, uh, Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to recognize Vice Chair Murkowski and my friend, Mr. Hoven. Thank you all for holding this hearing on the nomination of Rosalind So to be the Director of Indian Health Service. President Nez, um, it's an honor to be with you, my friend, um, to see you here and for your excellent introduction as well. It's good to see you. Um, Ms. So, congratulations um, on your nomination. And I especially want to recognize your family that is seated behind you and those that are watching online. And I want to thank each and every one of them for the support that you've lent to Ms. So as well not just during this confirmation and nomination process, uh, but through the entirety of, of her life. Thank you for what you've done, and it means a lot to me to see family here as well. Um, so I look forward to working with you to advance tribal sovereignty and important issues, many of which we've already worked on together, um, where we both have constituencies of responsibility uh, to make things better and to troubleshoot tough challenges. Now, the bipartisan uh, infrastructure law that passed included 3.5 billion dollars for IHS water projects over the next five years. Um, if confirmed, uh, you will oversee 700 million dollars annual investment in IHS water projects, over 10 percent of which are located between the IHS Navajo and Albuquerque service areas across New Mexico. Um, just this week, the Navajo Nation Council leaders highlighted concerns that IHS is building area water projects with construction materials that have caused system failures in years past. Ms. So, if confirmed, what will you do to maximize the lifespan of the IHS water projects and ensure that the agency is procuring quality materials for community water projects? Thank you, Senator, for that question. And I absolutely agree that water infrastructure and improving that for all American Indians and Alaska Natives is critical, especially right now as we are continue to navigate through COVID-19. With respect to the concerns that were raised by Navajo Nation, I am aware of those concerns. I have been working with the local tribal leaders to better understand what their issues are. Uh, however, as, as I know, uh, we are required to ensure that we buy proper uh, it, uh, to, uh, it, products to make sure that we have good water systems. In this particular case, so there is a balance between uh, the management operations ongoing operations. So once IHS completes a project, then we work closely with the tribal entity that will take over the water system as well as the homeowner. And so that's where there is not just IHS, but a broader set of uh, people that, that we need to continue to work with. I have worked very closely with uh, in, in Navajo, the NTUA, the Navajo uh, Tribal Utility uh, Office, as well as other partners to make sure that we together plan the projects, we together work on projects, and we will together complete the projects. And that includes education and training to the homeowner when the projects are complete. I appreciate that. And so because of your familiarity with this, I certainly hope you're in a position to look at this across the country. Uh, my concern that came up when I saw this report that came out, as you know, um, in other water projects in decades past, um, it's been proven that contractors used 
a PVC pipe when they should have been, for electrical purposes, when they should have been using pipes constructed specific to water and wastewater availability, and it deteriorated the system. And we cannot afford that to happen. So I look forward to working with you in that space. One of the other concerns that I have is with the rapid closure of so many IHS hospitals. Uh, recently, Acoma Cañoncito Laguna Hospital in New Mexico was closed and converted into a Monday to Friday 9 to 5 clinic. Um, I was troubled by the data underpinning this closure, which took place during a pandemic, and how the change was communicated to the Pueblos and to the community. So the question I have, Ms. So, is how will you look to ensure that IHS stems the tide of hospital closures? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I appreciate the conversation that we already had on this topic and will continue to work with you to ensure that Indian Health Service continues to maximize access to care for all of the patients that we, we serve. To that as well is that we honor the, the positions and the decisions of tribal leaders when they determine to take to assume their own health care systems under self-governance or self-determination. And that was part of this particular situation. I also want to point out that IHS is not this these issues are not limited to IHS. These issues are across the nation right now. You're probably aware of one of the hospitals in this little town that I live in in Gallup, New Mexico, where on a weekly basis, there are notices in the paper of the challenges that this facility, this hospital is having, which is adjacent to our Gallup Indian Medical Center. We want this hospital to be successful because if they're not, the care reverts to the Indian Health Service and therefore more impacting the American Indians and Alaska Natives that we have to, to serve. So it, it is a fine balance here in terms of making sure that our healthcare systems that we do maximize the health care systems and access to care for all of our patients. Uh, Senator, I will commit to continue to work with you on this issue and, and do whatever I can to ensure communication is flowing, not just with you, but with tribal leaders. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, while my time's expired, I do have one question on sharing uh, information, data sets with epidemiological centers, but I'll submit that into the record. Uh, it's always good to see you, Ms. So, your family, and again, President Ness, thank you for being with us today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lujan. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Cortez Masto is on the floor. Do we have, I feel like an auctioneer. Um, are, there, are there any other members online wishing to be recognized? If there are no more questions for our nominees, members will also submit up uh, follow-up written questions for the record. I would ask members to do that promptly. I'd also ask our nominee to respond fully and promptly to any follow-up questions that we may have, and also to meet with any remaining committee members who may wish to do so. The hearing record will be open for two weeks. Thank you, Ms. So, for your time and your testimony today. And this is Bring Your Daughter to work day, so I will now uh, recognize uh, my staff director's daughter to adjourn the meeting. This hearing is adjourned. Good job.